You're watching the sermon of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's sermon is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you would take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 3 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Now, I don't know how many of you saw the uh, videos I had posted on one of the church's Facebook pages uh, from the missionary we support uh, in the Ukraine there, Caleb Stuko. Um, there was a couple of videos that he had sent through the Facebook messenger, and uh, so I, I try to distribute that as much as I could. Um, one of those videos, though, is on YouTube, so if you would desire to see it, you can ask me, and if you haven't, and I can send you the link. Um, but as he's there in Ukraine and, and talking about uh, whether or not Russia will invade the Ukraine, he talked about what would prepare them for that. Uh, that, that could be devastating. And so what, what could prepare them? And what he talked about was having an eternal perspective. He, he talked about the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. He talked about the future hope that Christ has purchased, uh, that Caleb said he was looking forward to. And he said that nothing could take that away. And, and you know, I think as we see those videos and we talk about this, uh, one, it should be a reminder for us to be praying for Caleb and his family, uh, for the church there in Odessa, Odessa International Fellowship, and praying for all of our brothers and sisters there uh, in the Ukraine. But as he talked about this, I was so thankful as, as through the week hearing his videos, but also too as I was working through this passage and preparing for this morning, and, and they just fit together so well. That, that he talked about, that his hope is not in Russia not invading. Uh, that, that's not a very significant hope to have. But he talked about the great salvation that our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, has purchased for us. And that in asking what would get them through, whatever may be, it was their hope in Christ. Knowing their home is not here in, in this world, in this life ultimately, but their home is ultimately to be with their Lord and Savior. And so as, as Caleb was saying these things, again, it matched up so well with, with my study through this text. And so I, I wanted to share that and make sure we all thought about that and the things that he had said. Because as we turn here to 1 Peter chapter 1, we see that Peter was pressing uh, those Christians that were suffering on these same very things. That they would have a perspective that would bring them great joy, that would cause them to persevere even in the midst of suffering. Because they would have been born again into a living hope because Jesus Christ has died and rose again. That the great salvation that Christ has purchased for them would be their hope, would be their endurance, would be their joy, even in the midst of suffering. And my friends, it must be ours as well. And so last week when we introduced this series going through First and Second Peter, we discuss the authenticity of these letters, that they are written by the Apostle Peter. And we discuss that it seems probable, uh, especially his first letter, that he probably wrote from the city of Rome. And he wrote to those churches, to those chosen foreigners or chosen aliens or exiles scattered throughout Asia Minor in the different regions that he lists there in verse 1. And we saw how these recipients were chosen according to God's foreknowledge or according to God the Father's predetermination and by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to the obedience of Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. And so now we continue here in verses 3 through 9. And so let's, let's read together chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, as we had walked through Peter's greeting last week, here what we read is the beginning of the body of his letter. And so we get into that. And here we see Peter starts off with a doxology, with a praise to God. Uh, This was a common thing to start a, a New Testament letter with. We see this in many of Paul's letters. And such recognition towards deities was also common in Greco-Roman letters. Now, these specific doxologies in the New Testament are grounded in doxologies in the Old Testament. But as we see here in 1 Peter, they are Christianized, as Peter gives praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as in most other New Testament letters, it is only right for Peter to begin this way as he is addressing the hope, uh, the reasons, and the encouragements that these suffering churches have to stand firm, even in the midst of their suffering. And what we see here shows how followers of Christ can stand. Remember, we said the, the, the point of Peter's letter is to call these suffering churches to stand firm, to live holy lives. And so he's laying this foundation, so to speak, of how they can stand, even in the midst of their pain. And so Peter is pointing them ahead, not pointing them to their current situation, but looking beyond their current situation to what is to come, to their future hope. And so we see here in verse 3, it says that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And we see there in verse 3 that this is due to God's mercy. See, we deserve nothing but death and wrath from God due to our sin And so really, we deserve to already be in hell right now. That would be just for God to send us to hell. That's what we deserve. And yet, God has shown mercy. He's shown mercy to all, to anyone who's not already in hell. And yet, specifically to those whom he has saved, he has shown mercy by not sending us to hell, by the idea that we will never be in hell, but because he has purchased for us such a great and awesome salvation. So his mercy is the reason he does not leave us as we are in our rebellion against him to suffer the eternal consequences of it. But instead, he has made us new. We have been born again, and as we see here, born into a living hope. And God's mercy has supplied this new birth to a living hope, and he has supplied it through the gospel, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so all of this is what God has done. We are made new, given a new life in the power of Christ's resurrection, so that we are no longer who we used to be. And as one commentator points out, the fact that we are born again We should understand that we cannot take any credit for that rebirth any more than we can take credit for our natural birth. This is what God has done to make us new, to change us, and to make us born into a living hope. And this hope that we are born into in the new birth is a hope that could never be offered to us in the world. The world offers a hope that is based on wishful thinking, that is based on assumptions or circumstances. And when those assumptions turn out to not be fulfilled or when circumstances change, then that hope dies. No, but we who are saved have been born into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so since Jesus is alive, never to die again, then our hope cannot die. And so then we can ask, what is this living hope? Well, we see there in verse 4. It's in reference to the obtaining of an inheritance. 
And when we think about an inheritance, we think about something we receive, something that's passed down to us, something given to us. And anything that we can receive in this life, in this world, is not anything that can last. Anything in this sin-ridden world is something that's subject to rot or decay or corruption. But what we see about this inheritance is that it is undefiled. It cannot be ruined. It cannot be destroyed. It can't deteriorate or become corrupt. We also see here it is undefiled. It can't be ruined. There are no imperfections in it, and there will not be any imperfections in it. It cannot be stained, and it will never have any blemishes. It is undefiled, and it is unfading. It will not wither, it will not lessen, and it will not pass away. Anything in this life, like we saw when we were working through Ecclesiastes, is fleeting. It will not last. Everything on earth is subject to the destruction of moths and rusts, as Jesus said. Over time, they wear out, they break down, and circumstances change. Imperfections ruin our expectations, beauty fades, and death is a reality. But none of that is a concern for our future hope. Matter of fact, we see at the end of verse 4, this inheritance is kept in heaven for us, for all of those whom God has saved. This is a reality that is already fixed for us. And that's what Peter tells these chosen followers of Christ. God is keeping this for them. And think about what that means. That means that this inheritance is already a reality. God is right now keeping it for them. Now, it's a heavenly reality. So while Christians are on this earth, in this current state of things, they do not experience this inheritance yet. And yet it is nonetheless a present reality. It's already kept for them, being kept for them. Now, there are some who follow the false teaching where they believe that they have to work to obtain this inheritance, Uh, that this inheritance is not something that is kept and settled for them, but it it needs to be obtained and kept by them in what they do. And so if they were to fall into some mortal sin and and did not have the opportunity to make up for it according to their belief system, or for those too who are hoping in the fact that when they stand before God, they're they're trying to to hope for the fact that their, their good may outweigh their bad, which all of that is the very definition of a dead hope for every single one of us. But all of these things is that we have to work for this inheritance and we have to keep this inheritance, but that is not what we see here in the text. That is not what Peter says. This inheritance is already kept by God for us. God keeps it. And if you are trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, if you're right standing before God, you know it's only because of Christ's righteousness, not of anything of yourself, then you can trust that God is keeping this inheritance for you. This future hope is a present reality for you. It is secure for you, for all who believe. For you who, according to verse 5, who God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So not only is our inheritance secure, but we're secure as well. God is keeping our inheritance in heaven for us, and he's keeping us. Because we, who are guaranteed this inheritance, are protected by God's power. And when both your inheritance and you yourself are protected, there is nothing then that you could face, nothing that you could suffer through, that can take away your future hope. Absolutely nothing. Nothing will remove your inheritance from heaven. And nothing will cause you to ever be lost when you are securely saved in Jesus Christ. And the security of our hope is what this is getting at. It can't be moved. So even if the whole world were to come against us, even if all of hell were to come against us, we are secure. Our hope is secure. 
Our inheritance will not move, and we will not be lost. How can we be lost if it's secured, if we are secured in the power of God? Nothing can steal us away from God's hand. We cannot be lost any more that we can find anything that is more powerful than God. And clearly nothing is, so we cannot be lost. And we receive this security through faith. By faith, you came to know God's saving grace. You came to know the work of Christ who purchased you, paying for your sin, buying your salvation through his sacrifice and his resurrection power. And by that same faith through which you are saved, trusting in Christ for salvation, you are also protected by God. And protected for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And so both this inheritance and the salvation that he mentions here, both of them together describe our future hope, our living hope. And so too then, this salvation is a future salvation and is nonetheless a present reality as it is described, describing the inheritance that is kept by God. We see the eternal life that is yours who have been born again. This future salvation is a present reality that now is already prepared, is already to be revealed. This revealing is, again, a future revealing, but your salvation is ready now to be revealed. So your salvation in Christ is a present reality, and it will be revealed in the last time. Now, right now, we're in the church. We're in the the church age. And when the church age comes to an end, Christ will appear for his church and the dead in Christ will rise first and and the rest of the church will will meet them in the air and we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We will will put on immortality in the glorification of our bodies and we will be with our Lord forever. And then Christ will return and we will return with him and he will establish his kingdom and glory and power and he will reign on this earth for a thousand years. And we will reign with him. And when Christ then ushers in the eternal state, the new heaven and new earth, this is when our salvation, our inheritance, will be fully known. That we will be with him in this eternal state to know the fullness of our God as we recognize that our inheritance is Christ himself. And we will share in unimaginable glory forever. And verse 6 says, In this you rejoice. In this salvation, in this inheritance, in this future living hope that you have been born again into by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In this you rejoice. Even now you rejoice. Even though now is a time when we are grieved by various trials. The word here for grieve in the English Standard Version, uh, the Greek word means to cause severe mental or emotional distress. Uh, Severe humiliation or outrage uh, can also mean to experience sadness or distress. So even though we are in a time of distress due to various trials, we can still rejoice in this salvation, in this hope. And see what Peter is doing here. We see in verses 3 through 5, Peter has been building the foundation by which we can rejoice even in our trials. No matter what our trials are, no matter how we may suffer, we can respond to our trials in a God-honoring way, in a way in which we stand firm in the faith and we live holy lives. And it is in this assurance of our future hope Peter wanted these dear Christians in Asia Minor to lift up their eyes beyond their present suffering and see the great glory that Christ had purchased for them. And this is the lesson we need to learn more and more ourselves as well. 
How often are we dragged down and beaten by our current circumstances? How often do we fall into ruts that we feel that we'll never escape from? And we don't know very often how to deal with our our pains and our fears. We lose hope of ever getting out of the situation we're in, ever getting back on top. But the whole time in that and feeling beaten down and broken and and feeling like we've lost all hope, lost any motive to, to move on, that whole time we're focusing on the things that are causing us our pain. Our focus is on the, the right here and the right now that will, that never seems to end sometimes. We focus on how long we've been going through our sufferings and we forget that our current sufferings are not eternal. Matter of fact, we see here in verse six that in compared to eternity, Peter says that we only suffer for a little while. They're not eternal sufferings. And for Peter's readers, their future hope was the key. And no matter how hard their trials were, no matter how painful their persecution that they faced, Peter could point them to what was beyond the here and now and remind them of their future hope. And so you too and myself, we need to look to what God has accomplished for us in Jesus Christ. We need to look to what cannot be taken away, but what is secure. And remember what is to come. And let it remind you that what you face now is only temporary. No matter how unending it may seem, it's only temporary. What will really last is not what is, but what is to come. So again, verse 6 says, In this you rejoice. In this salvation, in this inheritance, in this future hope, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, if God in his sovereignty has deemed it necessary that you were to suffer these things, which means then you suffer these things for a purpose. There's a reason behind the fact that you grieve many trials, various trials, which again should give us hope. This isn't meaningless. God has a purpose in it. God has a a work for his glory in all of this. And yet still, through it all, you have such a great future hope that you can rejoice even now in the midst of your pain and trials. Which doesn't mean that you go on as if you don't have trials. It doesn't mean that you pretend like you don't have pain, that you ignore uh, the things going on around you. It means that, though, in the midst of your pain, there is still a reason to rejoice. A reason to rejoice that your current sufferings cannot take away. That you can endure whatever it is you face because you rejoice in such a glorious future reality. And it is a reality, or else there'd be no basis for us rejoicing. This is a guarantee for all who believe upon Jesus Christ for salvation. And then, too, we see at least one purpose is given to us of why God has it that we would go through trials and suffer. Verse 7 tells us these trials are so that your faith may be proven genuine. True saving faith is a persevering faith. And so standing firm through trials, not falling away from the faith, but holding to that faith until the end will demonstrate that your faith is true, that it is genuine. And Peter compares such faith to gold. Gold was proven genuine by being held in the fire. Anything that was not gold was destroyed by the fire. And the gold itself was refined and remained, even through the flame. And Peter tells these suffering Christians that their faith was of greater value than even refined gold. Gold that is makes it through the fire. For these true believers can persevere no matter how much pain they face or would face. From the midst of pain, they could rejoice in their Lord's provision and the security of their eternal hope. And so have all the more confidence as they persevered 
that their faith was, faith was genuine. And so have all the more confidence in the assurance of their hope. The inheritance kept by God and the salvation awaiting to be revealed. They could persevere. And so in the day that Christ is revealed, when he comes again to bring his reward for his people, such tested and persevering faith would result in the believer's reward, in praise and glory and honor. And to explain what is meant here by praise and glory and honor, John MacArthur compares this to Jesus' words to the faithful slaves in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. The words that so many faithful Christians live for hearing, long to hear. Well done, good and faithful slave. We long to hear those words one day. We live for that. And if you're sitting here and, and if you're not truly a believer, you, you may make a profession of faith, but if you're not in Christ, if you've not truly repented of your sins and are trusting in Christ alone for your salvation, uh, then to say you're living for those words, that, that those words are a motivation for you now to persevere, that, that may not make a whole lot of sense to you. But for those of us who are longing for that day to stand before our Lord, to see him as he is, to hear him say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, what a joy that will be. What motivation that is for us to live for him now, to persevere through whatever we face now. I long to hear those words. And in hearing those words, know we are with him and to be with him, to worship him and serve him like we've never been able to before, to be with him for all eternity. And when we come into our inheritance and that great salvation is revealed and fully experienced, to know him, we long for that. And we know that it's only by grace that we can look forward to that day. It's only because of his work in us that we could ever possibly hear the words, well done. Because by his grace, we have been saved and born again into a living hope. His mercy has supplied this for us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so with the thought of that day, when Christ is revealed, Peter knows that the true believer's longing is to see Christ, is to be with him. And that is our great inheritance. He himself is our inheritance. And so we persevere through whatever we must suffer through when we know that on the other side, we're going to be with Jesus. That when this life that has so many trials and pains on this earth now, when it's over, we're going to be with him. And having that secure hope, having that guarantee causes us to persevere that it is worth going through whatever it is we face because on the other side is Jesus. On the other side is unspeakable glory. It's our great inheritance, our living hope, fully realized. And so we persevere, we press on because there is nothing greater that we could behold but the glory of Jesus Christ. There's no more that we could desire than to know and experience our glorified Lord. And that is what is to come. That's not yet, that's what's to come. And so we read in verse 8, though you have not seen him, these believers in Asia Minor, uh, they did not know the man Jesus while he walked on the earth like Peter did. They did not see him, and yet Peter says, you love him. You have not seen him, but you love him. And he says, though you do not now see him, even in that moment, they did not see him. As they went through their suffering, they could not see him. And yet Peter says, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. These were people who threw everything they faced, the persecution that came to them because of their faith in Christ, they still stood firm in their faith in Christ. They trusted him. Because they knew what was to come. 
And so loving and trusting in Christ, they rejoice in their great salvation and their future hope, rejoicing with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. They were filled with love for Jesus. Their, their suffering didn't harden their hearts against him. It proved their love for him all the more. And filled with love and joy because they knew that they were obtaining the outcome of their faith, the salvation of their souls. Which when it talks about the salvation of their souls there in verse 9, it's talking about the salvation of the whole person. It's complete. It's total. This is what we look forward to, what presses us on in pain so deep, in trial so long, when we have this living hope. And so, my friends, I ask, do you have this hope that you have a future salvation where instead of experiencing eternal wrath that you have earned in your disobedience to your Lord, that you have earned in your sin against your Creator, in your rebellion against your King, that instead of knowing that wrath you deserve, you would know God's mercy. You would experience his grace, that you would be saved, your, your whole person made new, that right now you are being made new, but the day is coming when you will be new, and you will stand before your Savior whole and like him who is holy and glorious. And you see him, and that you can serve him and worship him for all eternity. Do you have such a great hope, this living hope? Have you turned from your sin and trusted in Jesus alone to save you from your sin? And so because Jesus has died and rose again, he has caused you to be born again into this living hope. It is this hope that Peter calls suffering Christians to stand on through all of their trials that they would persevere. Here is where your faith is shown genuine. That even though you suffer in this life, you stand firm with your eyes fixed on the future hope of being with your Savior, with your Lord, with Jesus. You stand firm in receiving your reward and entering into that inheritance. This living hope is such a glorious hope. It is a guarantee for all who are trusting in Christ that despite the pain we face, it can cause us to persevere with exceedingly great joy. And so, my friends, do you have this hope? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? And so I want to charge you, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, fix your gaze on that hope to persevere and stand firm in the faith. And if you're sitting here saying, well, well Scott, right now I'm really not going through a whole lot. Things are actually pretty good. Well, praise God, that's, that's great. I, I'm, I'm happy for you in that. But nonetheless, still, fix your eyes, fix your gaze on that hope now. Look to Jesus now while you're not suffering, because if you try to do it then in the midst of suffering, it's going to be a lot harder. But now, set your gaze, set your focus on that hope and live in light of that hope. Live in light of being with Jesus and seeing him one day, of worshiping him. And even if you're not going through trials now, it is worth fixing your gaze on him and living in response to that future hope. He is worth living for now, no matter what you're going through or not going through. He is worth your life being lived for his honor and his glory, that when you get to the end of this life, you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. He's worth it. In all of our joys and in all of our trials, he's worth it, our great and awesome God who is mighty to save. Trust in him. Live in light of this living hope that you who trust in Christ have been born into. Let's pray. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnbbc.com.